questioning is perhaps the greatest gift we have as human beings. Science is more than a body of knowledge. It's a way of thinking. It's a way of thinking that teaches us to question everything we think we know. Science came about by developing techniques, methodologies for gaining reliable knowledge about the world. We have at our fingertips the technologies that were only possible for the largest governments and corporations 20 years ago as an individual today. If the human civilization continued at anything remotely like the current pace of technology advancement for a million years, where would we be? I think we're either extinct or on a lot of planets. The good thing about science is that it's true whether or not you believe in it. We hold the scientific method in high regard because it works. If it stopped working, we'd throw it out. Discover the past. Create the future. This, this, this is the Here and How podcast. Welcome to the Here and How podcast, where every week we dive deep into big ideas to explore the past and create a brighter future. This is episode 13, How Old is the Earth? I'm Stephen Woodford, also known as Rationality Rules, and with me is the tremendous Thomas Westbrook, also known as Holy Kool-Aid, and the radiant Hello. Rachel Oates. <laughs> <laughs> Say hi, guys. <laughs> hi, guys. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> what I do next time, I'm going to leave space for the hellos and then not tell you to say hello. <laughs> I never know when to say hello. I, so I, I, just... I realised when I when I wrote the intro, essentially, that it does leave it ambiguous. This is good. Um, <laughs> and hello to everybody listening. <laughs> so I've decided to take on this question because it eloquently represents and embodies the scientific method and in doing so it elegantly conveys the value and potential of science as a whole. A lot of the topics that we've done before pretty much does what I've just said but I think this one's a it's it's specifically what's the best way to word it it gets to the core of it and I'm I'm sure we'll tap into that while, while going through it today. So to begin within the realm of science What's the difference between observation and inference? If you observe something, you can see that it's happened. You can kind of, I, I guess in some cases, you might be able to repeat it or you've actually like seen the actual thing. But with inference, it's like you, you look at other bits of data or other bits of information or evidence and then kind of like draw a conclusion from it. So in terms of like, I, I'm guessing you're going to bring this back to like dating the earth. We can observe things today like rocks and rock samples, but we can infer from them how old the earth is because we weren't actually there to see it. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, you. Am ba- I on the right track? No, yeah, you're, you're bang on essentially. Okay. I'll, uh, I'll read out what I've <laughs> written just because it puts it succinct. But uh, yeah, come, come in, Thomas. You, you're just about to speak. I was, I was going to say observation might be like if, let's say that I see someone playing guitar and a guitar string snaps then I directly observe that. Yeah. I visually, like, whether it's it's visually or whether it's through other senses or something, like, you're actually directly measuring something that's occurring as it's occurring. Whereas I would say inference would be, like, if you come about and you see a guitar later and you see a broken string and you see lots of people playing guitar and applying force and applying pressure on these strings and you see all the other strings intact, you can kind of infer that probably the process of playing was what broke the strings. Mm -hmm. And then maybe you you can gather other data points and other things that kind of let you infer that. Or if you have different data points, uh, different measurements, you can sometimes extrapolate um, where something is and draw inferences that way. Yeah, I mean, you're both bang on the money. It's almost like you both enjoy science. (laughs) What? No, don't be silly. I'm not a Indeed. nerd. Yeah, well, you know, it's, there's nothing wrong with being a nerd. Um, but I'm just going to put that succinctly, really, and that is observational science is based on what we can essentially experience, such as that the sky is blue, that a kettle was hot, and that there's a spider, a spider web within the corner of my room. Mm. And scientific inference is based on what we can conclude based on evidence and reason, such as that the kettle must have been recently on and that there was and perhaps still is a spider within my room. The The example that you just used with the string is a very good example as well, Thomas. So the the reason... Yeah, and, and, and it can... Yeah. I, I would point out too, like you can get more and more precise. So like oh, yeah. you can see that every single time they hit it, you could go down to a molecular level and see are there tiny little, you know... Uh, is there like a tiny bit of damage that's being done to the string or like the entire field of forensics is based off of um, scientific inferences it it is also with you saying about the accumulation of evidence uh, such as seeing each time you 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 pluck the string does it actually cause some kind of damage which could lead to a break that basically changes a hypothesis to a theory Um, it's a little bit more complicated than that but that's essentially how it works in the realm of science and the more evidence that supports the more facts that support that theory means that it's a stronger theory 
Anyway, the, the reason I bring this up is because, as, as you were mentioning, Rachel, the science of dating the Earth, and for obvious reasons, is a science of inference. It has to be. Um, but before I get into that science, I want to take us back a bit. In the 15th century, if you asked an educated European how old the Earth was, they would have referenced a person called James Usher and told you it's about 6,000 years, uh, years old, according to the biblical account of Genesis. Apparently the same is true of some people in America still today. <laughs> um, Wasn't it also on October 22nd? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I, I certainly read earlier on that it is. he did predict the month of October. I didn't know that he had it down to a date. That's, that's insane. Yeah. But um, primarily due to the Age of Enlightenment, by the 19th century, most people would have told you and will tell you today that it's much, much older and that Genesis is at best an allegory and not a literal account of history. Now, other than dating methods, there's many reasons that they can come to that conclusion. And I was wondering if you guys knew um, or at least can guess a few of them. So without using def uh, dating methods, how could people infer that the Earth is much older than 6000 years? Could it be something to do with like looking at the distance of stars and stuff like that, or is that just like the age of the universe? You could. Yeah, I'm not. I'm interested. I'm not sure what you mean by aside from dating methods, because yeah. I mean all of these are kind of dating methods. Yeah, I, I guess I guess that's a fair point. You mean as aside from from methods to measure the exact date, like things that we have that are older? Yes. So you can find things that imply it. So I guess I hadn't thought oh. of what you just said, but when you said the distance of stars you could um or if we knew how far stars travel and we found mm. that we knew their trajectory then yes that would infer that that the earth has to be old and six thousand years old but then mm -hmm. that doesn't that wouldn't necessarily mean the earth has to be more than six thousand years old only yeah, the universe that's the universe but um i think the claim does actually um the biblical claim does actually say the universe six thousand years so it would actually be a good example there <laughs> but no well, so, we have trees that are older than that yep yeah, we do indeed um and that's and that's a, that, one not just trees but <clears throat> here's something kind of cool about how you can can measure a tree or a tree's age is like so you can take little samples you know core samples where you drill into a tree and you take out a sliver and you look at how many rings you count up you know that one ring appears every single year and so with some of these trees they have like tons they have you know hundreds or thousands of rings and so you can kind of get the age of this tree well i'm pretty sure that we have trees that are you know over six well i know we have trees that are over six thousand years old but sometimes you can go back even further mm -hmm. because you can see in like a forest you might have you know a stump or something that is mm -hmm. fossilized and you can see the 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 layers in the in the stump there and some of the newer rings will overlap with other trees or other stumps and you can kind of measure by like when there was a drought or when there was a wet season mm -hmm. then you can see that the rate at which these rings are laid down and so it's easy for botanists to be able to compare different trees that lived at different times where the overlap was so like yeah. if they one was um planted you know 10 years before the other one died well there's going to be 10 rings that have like exactly the same um rates of uh ring or the size mm -hmm. between the rings are going to be the same yeah. during those periods or if there's a fire there's going to be like a, a dark area or something around the side yeah so, so yeah trees are is a great one i actually want to tap into it in just a second a bit more than do you remember you oh sorry <laughs> no 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 not at all so i was gonna say do you remember how old the tree is that we saw in the natural history museum Stephen? You know, the, the really, really big one. I think I do, but I'm going to mention that later. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, not at all. I'm zooming ahead. <laughs> no, the fact that your minds go straight to something that we can, you know, actually observe. It's it's also, it's one observation and two, it's more, it's more inference, but some people can plant a tree and observe it and go, look, I planted it 10 years ago. I've cut it down and there's 10 rings or however many rings it might be. It might be 20 or or I don't know, I'm not exactly sure on the science of it, but that's kind the viewing of putting it down and watching it grow. That's observation and the inference can be made afterwards. And so if that keeps on being consistent, you can basically throw that off to any tree that you see. And the accuracy is incredibly precise. But the examples I was going to show was that or mention. Can can I can I try and guess another one? Yeah, absolutely. Um, is it like the layers of snowfall in like a glacier or something like that? 
yeah, you're you're not far yeah. off. Yeah, it's, okay. it's one of the ones, one of the ways is with strata. Mm-hmm. Um, so people realised that the layers um, suggested that yes. they were laid down by natural processes in which the sea and land had changed places several times. Mm-hmm. That that's hard to be that. able to put into a box with six thousand years. Yeah. Um, studies of earthquakes and volcanoes showed that surface crust is subject to massive natural transformation which also would add to this. And of course, you have the observation of rain, wind and water erosion. And that shows that forces mm. are capable of reducing mountains and creating valleys. But we know that it would take a significant amount of time. So yeah. all of these things already suggested that this is not quite right. So basically what I'm getting at is that science dragged religion into the 20th century, kicking and <laughs> screaming. But we all know this anyway, basically. Well, if you look at, like, say you go to the Grand Canyon, and mm-hmm. you see those layers that you're talking about that, mm-hmm. you know, the layers of sediment. There's very, very, you know, you, it would take a very long time for these layers to be laid down. But you can see that there's a difference in the the Earth's strata. You can look and see that, you know, oh, this one's made up of this. This one's made up of that. And, like, you can mm-hmm. tell that it must have taken a long time for these layers to to form and to be yeah. Um, deposited. Yeah. And there was a scientist, um, I think it was... God, I'm blanking on his name. Maybe perhaps you've you've researched him, Stephen. Mm-hmm. Um, but he basically came to the conclusion that the Earth was between like two and four hundred million years old. And that was before there were any more accurate uh, measurements. But that was basically just looking at it saying like it can't. There's no way that this is six thousand years. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, Charles Darwin's granddad, Erasmus Darwin, he, he made predictions of that level. He just looked at it mm-hmm. and he said, there is no way that that can be 6,000 years old. This is absolutely absurd. Um, and essentially, that's where the study of strata basically lifted off. He, it was his observations, and he went to great peril to be able to find them. Again, Can I point out, too, for the, the creationist who says that, oh, it, it was just all laid down in a global flood, mm. we know what flood deposits look like. Yeah. Mm. We know when there's a big flood in a region, you know, a mm-hmm. massive regional flood, how it all just clumps together and, and will lay down a, a particular thing. It's It doesn't do it in very neatly defined layers like that. That's not how floods work. Yes. And another, another thing is, is that we actually know there's been five extinctions, which is a podcast that I'd like to do in the future. Five mm-hmm. mass extinctions, which wiped out each of them, wiping out about 90 percent, 70 to 90 percent of all life on Earth, which is absolutely insane. And we can see those. Um, we can see in the layers very clearly that that happened. Well, when it comes to the idea of uh, Noah's flood, there is no sign of it whatsoever in any of the layers. Now, that doesn't prove that Noah's Ark didn't happen, but it is evidence against it. And it's something that's very hard to be able to square. Uh, to put the no, square but Steve, stuff. it's just that, that what Satan did was after all the animals died in the flood and were <laughs> yeah, instantly yeah. fossilized, yep. he just separated all of the really simple ones and pushed them way down to the bottom <laughs> and pushed all of the complex ones up towards the top and organized it just yeah. so he could test your faith. I think I think that's the ad hoc fallacy. I love it. It's just oh, that does ruin my position. Let me change it for no reason without <laughs> and without good enough justification. But um, I want to get back to the dating methods. So mm-hmm. um, or I should say, let's get back to dating methods. What you do is maintain eye contact, ask them about their hobbies, mm-hmm. and split the mm-hmm. bill at the end. And that's how you yeah. win the man of your dreams, Thomas. Old lady of your dreams. <laughs> <laughs> So I thought you walk up to them and say, "Put your poo in." Me. <laughs> oh God, Jesus! And then if that doesn't work, you stare them right in the face. You put your hand on their shoulders and you say, "I am the storm." <laughs> Is that how um, you got your girlfriend? Yeah, she's a lucky lady. <laughs> it works every time. <laughs> <laughs> so, jokes aside, do you happen to know what dendrochronology is? Ah, uh, well. Chronology is something to do with time. Fantastic. Yep. Den- yep. Dendro. Ah, oh, I know this. Yeah, you. I you, don't. I don't know this. You're both so close to it. It's Isn't it like yeah. dendrites and like. Okay, here it is. Okay, we have dendro being ancient Greek for um somehow missed myself here. Dendro being ancient Greek for tree, 
Kronos being ancient oh. Greek for time and Logia being ancient Greek for the study of. Dendrochronology mm-hmm. is the study of tree time and more specifically it's the name given to the scientific method of dating trees. So it's basically what you guys were just talking yeah, about. And yeah. I was going to ask how do you know how it works and it seems that you both do so mm-hmm. I'll just recap it again and it's basically if you cut down a tree within it you'll see what are known as growth rings and since these rings grow according to seasonal patterns we can accurately infer the age of trees for the, many of the same reasons that you guys were saying uh you're saying that there's a very old tree um so here's a question for you both how old mm. is the oldest tree we've ever discovered the oldest it- living tree or the oldest living tree or the oldest tree fossil o- oldest tree period this is what i found anyway and it's alive evidently okay Twelve thousand talk- years oh. what do you I reckon was, i was gonna say are we talking like thousands or millions of years um I'm I'm gonna go with like a hundred thousand years. Okay. Something crazy. <laughs> All right. It's a spruce tree, uh, which is located in Sweden, and it's a staggering oh. nine thousand nine hundred and fifty years old. I was a little Hello. bit off. Yeah, you're a little bit off. Um, <laughs> however, no, that's why we're here though, is to learn. Yeah, exactly, and it's good fun. Um, something to throw in though is that depending on the definition of tree, there's a colonial colony tree, which is basically. Um, trees that are genetically identical because they share a single root system uh, that's 80,000 years old and Mm -hmm. we can also tell it's that age due to carbon-14 dating uh, dating, which we'll get into a little later on but the fact that you know trees already substantially invalidate the concept of uh, young earth creationism is quite telling and the irony is that Although it's not observational, it's so easy to access. Like, all you got to do is cut down a tree and you go, yeah, that method <laughs> works. And then when you see a tree that's that old, you, you've got you've got to have some serious reasons as yeah. to conclude that that's not the case. Um, now, the reason I bring up dendrochronology is to illustrate that dating via inference is ironclad. It absolutely works. We can observe mm-hmm. a tree being planted and then many years later have a dendrochronologist cut it down and accurately infer its age. And so we know to the extent that we pretty much know anything that dating methods work, or at least that dating method works. So here's where things get a little bit more complicated. Um mm-hmm. While the principle of dating rocks is the same as dating trees, the method is quite a bit different and it requires a rudimentary understanding of atoms. Um, do you guys know how how that works at all? Something to do with radioactivity and half-lives, right? Yep, yep basically. I, I don't know more than that. I don't know like what, what they look for, but yeah. I know it's something to do with that. What about you? Yeah, you would have... You'd basically, um, if, if you examine the chemistry of an atom... You're gonna have um, uh, the the number of electrons and the number of protons are always going to be constant, but the number of neutrons can be different in different isotopes. Like if you have you know more neutrons, it'll be a different isotope than if you have less neutrons. And as you have um, like like let's say, how complicated do you want me to get? <laughs> well, you're back basically bang on the money, and I'll um I'll lift off from there. So y- you know more than I. Well, did. just the the final the mm-hmm. final sentence mm-hmm. to kind of make that make sense is that um if you have a particular isotope that's unstable, then um or radioactive, it will decay into a more stable form. Yeah, and we know the rate that this happens at. So so far as I was reading um uh, throughout this research. Saying that an isotope is unstable is to say that we're not 100% on the numbers that we're giving because it's either too small or too big, or we haven't had enough experience with it. Whereas when stable is used in that context, it's to, it's to mean that we know enough to really say this is this is the half-life of this, this, uh, this isotope. So what I basically want to open with is that I'm no expert and this would be a really good time to have an expert on the podcast. And I want to use this as a side note to say to people that if you're a science lecturer or if you're a science enthusiast and you have areas of expertise, get in touch with us because we do want people on the podcast and it would, it would be great to have these kind of conversations and bombard you with questions that you just simply weren't prepared for. Um, <laughs> But to put it very simply, an atom is comprised of protons, neutrons, and the nucleus, and around the nucleus are electrons. I'm basically repeating what Thomas just said, but the total number of protons and neutrons an atom has gives the atom what is called its mass number. Now, while an atom is um, 
of a, sorry, while an atom of a certain element is all, always has the same number of protons, it has a different number of neutrons and therefore has a different mass number. So, for example, carbon always has six protons, but carbon-12 has six neutrons, while carbon-14 has eight neutrons. And as you were saying, Thomas, the difference between how many neutrons they have dictates that it's a different isotope. So I hope I haven't lost people um, mm. at this point. But certain isotopes are radioactive, while others are not. For example, carbon-12 isn't, while carbon-14 is, and it's the radioactive isotopes that comprise the study of radiometric dating, and it's due to made radiometric, uh, radiometric dating that we know the age of the Earth. Quite a mouthful, and it is a big study, and it's hard to push down into a small area to convey on a podcast, especially someone that, that hasn't got an expertise in this area. But um, I hope that it, that sufficiently gets it across. So let's let's go to a half life. Do you guys know what a half life is, and can you explain it in better detail? So I'm I'm not going to be able to give like a very good definition, but very very simply, it's the time period it takes for like a what what is it like an isotope or something to to half decay. Is that yeah? My, yeah, my yeah. words are a bit off today. <laughs> yeah, no, that that's pr that's pretty much bang on. Yeah, yeah. The, the way I've got it written down here is that it's mm -hmm. it's the time required for the quantity to fall to half of its starting value. So okay, that's better than what I said. Yeah, <laughs> but I have the advantage of looking this up today, so don't you worry. Um, <laughs> an example would be carbon fourteen has a half life of five thousand seven hundred and thirty years, which means that every five thousand seven hundred and thirty years, half of a carbon fourteen sample will have decayed. So pretty simple stuff, right? And you can see how it's similar to. But that means dendrum. in like eleven thousand years or whatever, it's down to like a quarter of the mass, right? Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah. So if you had yeah. a, if you had a hundred carbon atoms, yeah. to put it, um, uh, carbon. Um, I've lost my word here, neutrons. Mm -hmm. um, over 5,730 years, it would reduce to 50. And then over mm -hmm. another 5,730 years, it would reduce to uh, 12 and a half. Um, so basically, that's, that's essentially how it works. Um, but what this means is that in excess of 60,000 years, carbon-14 unfortunately isn't useful at dating anything. And since mm -hmm. dendrochronology dates organisms, uh, let alone uh, sedimentary rocks, etc., mm -hmm. to 80,000 years, we obviously can't use carbon-14 to date the Earth. So just, just for everyone listening, if you ever hear a creationist saying that um, carbon dating... Um, I forget what they've used. They used carbon dating to date dinosaur fossils. And then they said, oh, look, there's a problem here. And it's like, yeah, that's because you can't use that <laughs> method to date it. Plus, dinosaurs, dinosaur bones don't contain carbon. But that's a topic for another day, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is a slight side note, but I found this really interesting. And it's a possibility that, despite your knowledge, you might not know this one. Um, evidently, we're fortunate enough to know the half-life of pretty much every isotope we have our hands on. And one of the smallest is hydrogen 7's 23 yoctoseconds. And one yoctosecond oh is one trillionth of a trillionth of a second. <laughs> so quick. And God. the biggest is called bismuth, or one of the biggest, I should say, which has a half-life of 19 exa years, which is 19 quintillion years. Damn. That's a number that far exceeds the age of our universe. I wow. personally find that mental. Like that it's is crazy. so much. So it would take so much more time for that to even have half of its uh, neutrons uh, dissipate um, than the age of the universe, which is absolutely crazy. But the reason I'm um, going through this is to get to the big one, which we've used to date the Earth, and the most prominent isotope for dating the age of the Earth is argon argon which has a half-life of 1.24 billion years, and it's been used to date small minerals of what's called zircon, which have been found deep below the Earth's crust to give us a date of around 4.54 billion years. That's impressive. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Damn. Yeah. Well... Can I point out, too, that, like, there... So there are rocks. <clears throat> I think the oldest rock that we've found was in Australia. And it dated to about like four billion years, but it wasn't um, because like when when the the Earth was very like hot and covered in magma and whatnot, then 
the rocks and stuff would not have survived. They would have been destroyed and melted. Mm-hmm. Whereas these these zircon crystals that you can find like inside of the Earth's crust or inside of rocks, they're much much more um, versatile. They're much they they can survive in much more extreme circumstances like um, mm. magma. Uh, but even even like the rocks and stuff, like you can you can smash a rock, you can boil it in oil, you can like you know try to to destroy it in any way and like unless the rock itself is completely like broken down and shattered and dispersed and everything and melts and whatnot then the the atomic structure is extremely extremely stable that's why it's so reliable to date it over long periods of time like this yeah man that's a that's a really good point because obviously under such duress you know being underground that far and the conditions of Tech, um, plate tectonics you're going to crush mm-hmm. these things to nothing um, but the can, very idea uh, yeah yeah go ahead can I point out one other tiny caveat just for our, our listeners for accuracy's sake is um, from, from what I've read like zircon crystals um, were dated back to I think 4.3 or 4.4 billion I could be slightly off but it wasn't quite the age of the earth yes like it gets us it gets us really damn close but I don't know if you were going to mm-hmm. go into that um, I was yeah, go oh, ahead. sorry. No, go I was ahead. gonna say, I I have a question, and that, how do we know that these rocks have been on Earth for the full four point six billion years? How do we know they weren't just floating around in outer space, and then God was like, "I'm gonna pick these up and put them on Earth <laughs> six thousand years ago"? <laughs> um, do you know the answer to that one, Thomas? <laughs> yes. Go for it. So we we know how planets form. Right. Mm-hmm. We've we have we're surrounded by, you know, hundreds and hundreds of billions of stars and we can observe stars forming together, planets forming together. And so we know, like, when you look at a nebula, you see, you know, a solar system all forms kind of at the same time. Mm-hmm. You'll have, you know, a, a star that will um, explode all of its guts out into the cosmos and all of that, uh, those those guts, those rocks and stuff, like you're like, oh, okay, that is kind of like the formation point is like it's all spewed out into the cosmos. These rocks have just been formed in the hearts of the star. And then they kind of coalesce to form a planet. Well, because all of these rocks were technically, you know, they're, they're, they're forming into a planet, but the age of the rocks are all going to be the same, mm-hmm. right? They are... Um, they, they all were, were formed in the heart of the star around the same time. So when you go and you look at our solar system and you try to get the age of our planet, well, there's there's going to be meteors and there's going to be asteroids and stuff that are that are in our solar system that you can measure and they're going to have the same life or the, the same age as the Earth itself. So we've measured rocks from the moon, which is um, much more stable. Like you don't have on the moon, you don't have like volcanic eruptions and tectonic shifting, and you don't have all these things, weather and erosion and stuff that you have on earth. So you can measure rocks, moon rocks, and you get the same date as um, some of these old rocks. You get like 4.5 billion years old. You can measure um, asteroids that have hit the earth and you break them up and you look deep inside of them and you measure um, the age of these asteroids, and you you get the exact same age mm-hmm. as as what we would expect for everything else in our solar system. That's awesome. Yeah, that's like, cool. This, this this all sounds really really convincing, but um, what about God? <laughs> yeah, where, where where does God come into this? <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm a little bit confused. Like, did did he do all this or? <laughs> You know, I'm I'm going to leave it to the theocrats to be able to get that to work because <laughs> I can't do that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, no, it's good. The the I I will say. Can I point out one objection that creationists have? Of course, of course, yeah, absolutely. Is they're, so they're always trying to look for holes to to poke in this, but oftentimes it's done from a slightly dishonest or disingenuous position. And yeah. a great example of this, there was a. Uh, I think he was a geologist with Answers in Genesis. I forget his ex- exact name, but he collected these samples from Hawaii, from these rocks newly formed out of like magma, and he sent it off to a bunch of different labs and to try to fool them. And he didn't tell them when it was formed. Ah. And they got several different results. Well, that seems like a nail in the coffin to science. And it's like, oh, man, like he uh, he fooled them. He really showed them. Wouldn't but the they problem just was be that... metamorphic rocks made up from like lots of pieces of old rocks plus magma? Well, the 
that's that's the problem is that yeah. he was very he was very dishon uh, he was very uh disingenuous in like how he submitted it to them mm -hmm. and what he didn't tell them is the way that he collected his samples was not it's it was not with the care and precision that a scientist would and so mm -hmm. he had a lot of contaminants in with the rocks yeah uh. and so they weren't just measuring the newly formed magma they were also taking in all of these um, external contaminants mm -hmm. yeah and so that's why they were getting different results. But then when they, they took the same samples and they got rid of all the contaminants, then they all came to the exact same measurements and got mm -hmm. the exact same readings. Yeah. No, but he didn't, he never, he never made that clear. He never t told that side of the story. So it just seemed a little dishonest. Yeah. Um, a similar thing that I've seen is somebody's taken a fossil and it's very old and they've sent fragments to different uh, labs and they've said, can you carbon date this? As in implying that in order for to carbon date something, 60,000 years is about as far as you're going to go with carbon-14 at least. And mm -hmm. they didn't tell them, and so the results come back mm -hmm. with all sorts of things. They were consistent with their results, but it wasn't telling you that it was yeah. old because it can't ascertain that. That's gone, you know. Um, and it was contaminated as well, as, as <laughs> similar to what you were just saying. So those, dis, those disingenuous approaches to try and overturn knowledge is just that it's disingenuous but it it happens a lot unfortunately and yeah it's good for you to point it out i had a question actually thomas for what you were saying about the formation of the earliest or the oldest um uh, dated material that we have on earth and indeed the moon as you were saying is it that it was formed in a local star and then thrown into this solar system is is that what you're saying or yeah i mean that's that's how all all matter comes about yeah. is through you know a process of uh, yeah. stellar nucleogenesis where all the atoms are formed in the hearts of stars and yeah. then as this star as the the nuclear fusion rates uh, start to use up all the fuel the, st the star itself will collapse in on itself and then explode all of its guts if you will out into the cosmos and then that can coalesce into to making you know planets and moons and stuff so um, but oftentimes it's kind of in belts hmm. and stuff and then there'll be other gases that will cluster form together that will um, fuse into a new star mm -hmm. so, so if you have a star that forms basically all of the matter that we experience because as, as you're saying it dates to a similar date um then that star erupts or implodes or whatever happens depending on the star and would that not mean that when you date those things with things that you can actually date it with that actually what you're dating is the formation of that material rather than the formation of earth because earth requires mm. an accretion around a sun you can't if you're dating the material that means that all you can get from that is the age of the material not the age of the formation of earth i was wondering that's well, kind that, of what i was thinking that's true but that's why when they say that when they're they give measurements for the age of the earth they like they'll say 4.5 um million or 4.5 billion years but then they'll also they'll throw in a caveat where they'll, where they'll say like plus or minus a hundred million years. I see. Or something. Oh, okay. Like you, you can get so accurate, but at oh, the yeah. same time, they're like it. You know, it would have taken time for you know th this belt of um, rocks and asteroids to to coalesce into a planet, to collide and to form into something. That makes you perfect know. sense with with the rest of the information that I have. Actually, thanks for clearing that up. Um, yeah, that, that's that's pretty cool. The way I had that down was that the deeper we go to really deep places where there's just no life, there is no evidence of basically much going on um, to do with life anyway, that's where we can find some of the stuff which we date as that old. And we find plenty of it, but we can't find anything further. And so we have to say, so far as we know, that's how old it is. Could be older, but that's as far as we know. Um, yeah, so I was going to, as, as far as the question of how old the Earth is, that is essentially, in a nutshell, where we're at. It's, uh, science, scientists currently place it at that because that's, that's the oldest known minerals. And um, we can com comfortably, sorry, the oldest known minerals that, they can, that we, they, can comfortably consider to be indigenous to Earth. So I have a small quiz for you, but considering your mm -hmm. points on the moon, etc., I reckon you're going to be pretty good at this one, Thomas. <laughs> So, if the Earth is 4.54 billion years old, how old do you think the Moon is? The same. Yeah, so you think the same. Yeah. Yep. 
it it basically is um from the resources i was finding they put it at 4.53 billion years old but Ooh. that could be <laughs> due to many things such as not having mm-hmm. enough samples etc so can yeah. i ask a potentially stupid kind of related slightly unrelated question of course and thank you um <laughs> what <laughs> this is going to be potentially sound really stupid but like what does the center of the moon look like? So, like you, you know, like with the mm. Earth, we like know the structure, and we know, like you know, inner core, outer core, this, 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 and we we know the layers, and we know basically, like you know, this is magma, this is this, this is this. What's the moon like inside? I don't know. Do you know at all, Thomas? I honestly, I don't know if. Yeah, because I, I know with with the Earth, there's so much pressure. Yeah. And there's the, that the pressure basically you know, like, keeps it molten in the center, doesn't it? It keeps it and keeps hot. It, it keeps yeah. it hot. The very, I think, the very, very center of the Earth is solid just because of how much pressure there is. I could mm-hmm. be wrong yeah. on that, but yeah. then I think around yeah. that there's a layer of like a molten core. Yeah, yeah. I don't know because the the moon is is significantly smaller than the Earth, mm-hmm. but I don't know. It's a really good. I will Google that while you continue talking. Yeah, I was just okay. gonna say it's, it's a really good question, but I would yeah. think that <laughs> if the evidence we have for the earth having a core that's very hot and a a specific description if that evidence applies to the moon and other celestial bodies then we can again we can infer that that might be the case we don't know for sure but certain things we can't know for sure and the age of the earth is one of them all we have is inference it's a bit like when we witness a murder and Mm -hmm. no one was there there's no cameras there is no observational evidence it has to be built on inference um but that's a really good question i don't know but we're gonna find out because we have our top (laughs) researcher going through google so this is according according to space.com it says early in the moon's history the interior was molten enough to produce volcanoes though it quickly cooled and hardened lava also Ah. burst from the crust when uh large enough asteroids broke through the surface oh wow Wow. that's that's quite cool yeah so I know a lot of the craters on the moon are due to like asteroids hitting it and stuff, but do you reckon any of them could be the remnants of the volcanoes? Maybe. Yeah, I don't see why not. Um, yeah. I'm like, sorry. I know this is a bit off topic. I'm just kind well, of the, asking. Well, the now. craters. It's good. I, I, yeah, it's good questions. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but you were saying you were saying about the craters. Well, I was, I was saying, I, I think most of the craters that we see are from, from asteroid impacts, but I mean, you can have volcano craters, and if, if it did have volcanoes, the, I don't see why some of them aren't. Mm. But, yeah, that fits. That, that, that I don't know. So well. I <laughs> encourage all of our listeners to do more research on the moon. Yeah, it's amazing. It's something that I, I had so many subsequent questions, not quite as cool as the moon one, and whether or not it's <laughs> solid, that's a great one. <laughs> But I did have, of course, questions of how we know the age of other places. And, you know, science does this. It develops a first in us and it makes us want to ask more questions. And I just realized that it reminds me of a quote that I think Hitchens said. It's probably been said many times before. And that is, the more you know, the more you know, you know less about I Hang on. You guys might be able to word it better than me. I think it was, Um... the more you know, the more you know, you know nothing. It's essentially yeah. what it's yeah. kind of trying to convey. And it's almost <laughs> frustrating. Um, uh, Albert Einstein referred to it as a circle. Yeah. And he said that mm-hmm. if if the diameter of the circle is everything that you know, the circumference is everything you realize you don't. <laughs> and you will always know, you'll always realize you know less than the things that you actually know. And as that circle gets bigger and bigger and bigger, you'll realize just how mm-hmm. little you actually do know. <laughs> yeah, that would make yeah. sense. It's mm-hmm. a good way of putting it. So I only have. A I just f- want to say I just found out that the moon isn't made of cheese. What? Well, we're gonna have to or do is it a, a debate cheese on this. volcano. <gasps> it's like Ooh, a melted fondue. cheese fondue. <laughs> <laughs> oh, can we go on a day trip to the moon? Actually, h- 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 here's a question for you: Would you go mm-hmm. to the moon if it was all offered for you, like price? Oh everything. hell yes! And oh, yeah. absolutely. But the deal was, there was you have to stay there for the rest of your life. Oh. <laughs> do I? D- yeah. Do I get to Can I wait books? until I'm 70? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's probably the best way of doing that. Yeah. Well, I have the internet. Yeah. Yes, yeah, you get the internet. Because I think as as amazing as it is to go to the moon, it's like you have this incredible space trip out there. You know, you mm-hmm. have this experience on a rocket, and then you're like, I'm on the freaking moon. But then you can't really, like, 
share it with anyone. You can't like go to a bar and be like, yeah, I walked on the moon. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't, you don't have those stories. There's no one really to talk to. Mm -hmm. I think it'd get really boring just sitting on the moon. Like even if you had all your food and water and air and stuff taken care of. I'd want like the internet, a camera, some books and Cairo. I would, if, if I had like a live (laughs) streaming service, I would just continually like, yeah, play with mess with flat earthers and moon landing <laughs> conspiracy theorists. They would hate you, deniers. I wonder where you're like, going today, there. Yeah, yeah. Today <laughs> we're gonna throw a ball on the moon. <laughs> <laughs> Tomorrow it's gonna hit us in the back of the head. <laughs> you know what you were just saying, Rachel, with what you would bring. It remind me of mm-hmm. some thing that they used to do in the UK on some show. I didn't even watch it, but I know they would bring celebrities on and ask them what they would bring to a um island in the middle of nowhere oh, they used to do, like desert island discs and stuff didn't yeah, they? yeah that's like what music. it was yeah. i only i only know it because i remember listening to Rick, ricky gervais talk about it yeah. um do, yeah do so they did um room 101 as well which was like the opposite and they'd have celebrity yeah. guests on and they'd put whatever they hated most in the world in room 101 oh man someone needs to <laughs> go on there and put yeah. flat earthers in it oh <laughs> I just have a bunch of globes. <laughs> <laughs> well, it would have to be a flat one. You can't put the globe in. You would have to put like this flat piece in. This model doesn't work. Put it in. Um, but no, oh, sorry, that... sorry. Carry on. No, no. I, actually, what three items would you bring to, with you to the moon? I think I just said. <laughs> I, thought, oh, I heard. I heard the get... books. What was the okay, other two? Tell you what. Instead of books, we'll just go with Kindle because you can fit a lot of books on there. Kindle, camera, and uh, the other one was between. Kyra and like a painting set. But I think I'll probably go with Kyra. Do you bring your dog to the moon? Yes. <laughs> that does make sense, to be fair. <laughs> what about you, Thomas? The Earth. <laughs> you bring the Earth to the moon. Um, I, I of course, that would probably kill possible. everyone. possible. But... Yeah. <laughs> it would kill everyone, but it, it, it does remind me that, um, again, we've learned from inference is that during the early stages of the Earth's accretion, the moon and the Earth basically collided or more accurately a meteorite hit and it made a big chunk of the earth go off and start orbiting around it and that's how the moon got here you can call me death destroyer of worlds (laughs) i am the storm (laughs) (laughs) too freaking good so i have two more questions for you Mm -hmm. how old do you think the sun is because you were saying just then about the formation of most things. Um, I'm not going to give you any more more t- uh, insight. What do you reckon? A- age of the sun. Five billion years. Okay. It's a hard question. Yeah, this is diff- I'm I'm trying to think cuz I've yeah. I think I've heard this before. I know the age of the universe, I know the age of the earth. Uh-huh. I know the sun is less than the universe, but I think it's older than the earth because it formed and then its gravity kind of Yes. So okay, we well, we go to this the the other question that I had and that was how old do you think the solar system is? Um 42 actually, should... billion years. 4.2, yeah. 42. Uh, 42 billion yeah, years. Yeah. <laughs> okay. It existed. Well, so so that gets that actually gets really tricky and I think mm. we we should dedicate an entire episode to it. Yes. But right yeah, now yeah. around around what is it? 13.2 billion years? No, that's the universe. Well, that, I thought that's what you asked. Oh uh, no, solar system. Sorry if I said that wrong. Oh. Oh, the solar system. Um this would be another case of someone going back and going, you did say that, and I'd would, be like, I'm sorry. Wouldn't our solar system be the same age as the sun? You would think so, but from what I looked up, it's not. Six billion years. Six billion years for the solar system, and the Earth is 4.53 billion. Is that what you reckon? <laughs> what about Wait, you? No, I, I don't know. I said, I, I'm, I'm talking in billions, not millions, right? Yeah, sorry. Yeah, billions, okay, yes. okay, good, yeah. Just checking. <laughs> yeah, you go just millions of years. Yeah, that would, yeah. That would work. I, I think the Earth is 4.6 billion years old and the universe is maybe like three years old. Just three. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, um, basically, the Earth is 4.53 billion years old, give or take a few million, as you were saying. And the solar system is 4.57 billion years old. So oh. not a great deal. <laughs> 
older um but that kind of makes sense um the sun is older by 0.03 billion years and for some reason when i first read that i found that a bit peculiar but then of course that makes sense it's called the solar system so of course the sun's going to be older it has to be but um because that would be all of the so so you have the sun form like in in a gas cloud like a nebula mm-hmm. and and it forms into you know the sun and then all of its gravity pulls in all the the surrounding gases and stuff and then once the once the sun is formed which it it only takes all it takes is gravity matter and time because all the pressure of all this this mass coming together and all of the the friction and the pressure and stuff causes it to ignite and form a, a sun but once you have the sun formed, then its gravity would pull all of the surrounding objects that are being blasted out into the cosmos by other stars that are dying would form into a solar system and form into planets, yeah. right? Yep, pretty much. And then the accretion of those planets, and you have the planets. And it makes sense that it's all dated to a similar time because it's all built from the stardust of an exploding star. Um, was it was it Carl Sagan that had a good quote on that? We are all su- stardust or something. Yeah, but um, or as Hitchens put it, forget Jesus. Stars died so that you could be here. Oh, that was uh, mm-hmm. Lawrence. Krauss. I was just as I was saying that, I was like, yeah, that was Lawrence. Yeah, mm-hmm. which is which is a great one as well. So, in a nutshell, that's the episode. I have a couple more random questions. Yeah. Okay. Is go that okay? For, yeah, go for it. We'll uh, we'll okay. get them in. So you know how like when they sometimes find like um. What is it? It's in amber, I think. You can get little air bubbles and stuff, and they like extract the air, and they can tell you like what, um, y- you know what, like the air in the atmosphere was made up of and stuff like that. They can do that. Oh yeah, in, yeah, yeah. In old stuff, can you use that to like figure out a date? Like, can can you tell the date from the air, or do they do like you know dating stuff on the amber and then just extract the air and? do it that way yeah i think you can it's, tell a yeah, great deal from it I, I don't know if i made that question like clear or not <laughs> mm. the only way i think i know what you're asking Rachel. yeah you're trying to say like by by looking at the the atmospheric mm-hmm. makeup yeah. inside or the the, yeah. the gas makeup inside that tiny little bubble can you tell mm-hmm. the age that that bubble was trapped mm-hmm. in there yeah or, and or do you I, have to figure out the age some other way and then just learn about the atmosphere that way um, I don't know with an amber, for sure. But if it's possible, I think that the way you would have to do something like that is so you know how you mentioned earlier ice cores that form mm-hmm. that um you can kind of try to basically you go to some place like Antarctica, which is um you know pretty stable like you don't have you know volcanoes and floods and stuff in Antarctica. Um, at the, you, you can only go back so far with this, but mm-hmm. um we have ice cores that we know that the um, ice layers are laid down at a pretty consistent rate. And we also know, like, you can kind of see, you know, where during the summer it might melt a little bit and then it'll form another one. You can see, um, similar to how trees grow, you can see uh, a year in these ice cores. And you can go back, uh, scientists can go back as far as 1.5 million years by drilling down and getting these massive ice sheets. Mm -hmm. And... Then they can look at the little bubbles inside of those ice cores and to to measure what the atmosphere was like mm-hmm. ten thousand years ago, a hundred thousand years ago. So they can look at at these these um, little bubbles and see, oh hey, you know, five hundred thousand years ago or this however many hundred thousand years ago there was a major ice age, and then there wasn't an, another mm-hmm. one until this point. So they kind of come in in cycles yeah. depending on um, you know the the Earth. It's it's orbit around the sun. It's not a perfect mm-hmm. circle. It's not a perfect like it. There's there's phases where it'll be a little bit further, a little bit closer, or stuff like that. And so they they might be able to try try to figure out like when do the ice ages happen? What causes them? And then they'll, they'll also look at like how much carbon was in the atmosphere to create like a greenhouse effect. Mm. Yeah. And so you can look at this I, if you were to to measure something like uh, how old is this um, this little bubble. I don't know if you could accurately date it because you, you'd have to take a lot of things into to account. One of them is that, you know, you're going to have points where there's slightly more carbon in the atmosphere. There's points where it's slightly less. There might be, you know, it might go up and down and up and down. And so it might be hard to pinpoint an exact time period. 
But if, mm-hmm. if you were to measure it, I would think that might be how you do it is just compare what we know the atmosphere was like at a particular time to what it's yeah. like in. Yeah. So I was just going to add to that. So if you take, for example, the meteorite 64 million years ago that hit, one of the reasons we know that happened is because there's basically an alien substance. Forgive the word alien. That's probably the worst word I can use. Um, but a substance that isn't plentiful. A foreign substance. A foreign substance that is found um, in the layers of that area worldwide. And when they dig up um, some amber, which is basically covered in rock, and the rock itself is also that stuff, one, you can already infer that that probably comes from that time. And two, when you open it up and you can look at the air, as you were saying, within it, and the air correlates with the atmosphere that we understand was there due to um, other evidence we can it becomes like a cumulative so we can go oh this is this is very interesting there's there's similarities here and we can even with even more confidence say that that probably does come from that time um one of the best things related to looking at layers and looking at how the atmosphere uh, atmosphere tips that we can get from it or knowledge about the atmosphere during those times is basically the amount of carbon um i uh I want to explain it, but I don't know well enough, so I'll save it for another episode, just because I don't want to mm-hmm. get get the wrong thing there. But yeah, that's okay. <laughs> so, la- one one last question that I have is that you know when people like Ken Ham, who are totally legit scientists, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> <You> know- <laughs> Did he get his um, his license to study his education <laughs> from a cereal box? <laughs> Probably something <laughs> like that. But it was like one of those kids' cereals. It was like Frosted oh, yeah. Freddy's. No, he got you know? a decoder ring and he, he got one of those decoder <laughs> rings in a cereal box and used it on a Bible. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so, you know, when like people like him look at like tree rings or the like glacial layers and stuff like that, and they're like, oh, but how do we know this really happened over like this many hundreds or thousands of years? Like, how do we really know? And then he tries to make claims that, like, oh, these three layers might have come down in, like, three different months, not three different years. Like, how do we respond to something like that? The thing about Ken is that as he was... It, it was Ken that had that debate with Bill Nye, right? Yeah. Yeah, he, that's, his, that's his, what I'm basing this question on. <laughs> well, yeah, well, his fundamental premise was essentially the rejection of scientific inference. He's basically yeah. saying that scientific observation is all we have, mm-hmm. which is He's saying, really... were you there? Well, yeah, because you can actually <laughs> say to him, what, did you witness your own birth? And obviously he didn't, mm. and he certainly doesn't remember it. Mm-hmm. Th- therefore, it didn't happen. Like, this is just mm-hmm. not how it works. Um, yeah. I think, really, you have to get to the foundation of things before you can address details. So if there is a fundamental axiom, a a serious disagreement or a lack of understanding or ignorance at the beginning Mm -hmm. then often having conversations higher up uh, where there's more detail is an act of futility that's been Mm -hmm. my experience with debating people at least well one thing too with these pastors is oftentimes they'll they'll put forth these statements like well you know nobody was around 100 million years ago you don't know that all the laws of physics and everything was completely different back then yeah Mm -hmm. And it's just, it's like they, they have to throw out everything that we know about the world in order to try to make their model work and in order yeah. to try to make it fit. And I think that, you know, you, you do have to resort to Occam's razor and say, you know what, like all of this stuff has been pretty constant. We've measured it the same way. We've mm-hmm. never seen any discrepancies. We've never seen any of this not work according to the laws of physics and the laws of nature. Yeah. And uh, we've never seen chemistry just completely stop working. And we're getting a better and better understanding of how this works. And we have a really, really good understanding to the point where we can accurately look at the atoms mm-hmm. and see the rate of decay. And we can see that it's constant and that it's always been constant and that mm. we measure it again and again. Massive, massive samples. And we can look at we're talking like, you know, you might say, oh, well, you know, how do you how can you tell that it takes, you know, one point four billion years or whatever for um, is it potassium to to degrade into argon I, I forget the exact one but there's different isotopes yeah, right and you're like yeah, well yeah. if it takes 1.4 billion years for half of it to degrade that's impossible to tell it's like no it's not you're looking at a sample yeah of like if you take a big clump of this stuff yeah there are so many atoms in that we're mm-hmm. talking billions hundreds and hundreds of billions or trillions of atoms in this tiny tiny little cluster of stuff and so 
when when you're looking at the the rate of decay, it's like you can tell, you can figure out the rate of decay even without half of it decaying right in front of you. You can mm-hmm. still, you know, tell pretty accurately um using mass spectrometry like how fast this is is you know decaying. And then you can figure out for every single different element, you know. Yeah, this, this assertion about you don't really know comes back to what we were coming, what we were talking about in our first episode, really. And that is the a lot of people who don't like these discoveries, they they need, they assert that you must give them 100% knowledge on something. And it doesn't work like that. We don't know anything apart from, again, one thing, maybe, in my opinion, with 100% certainty. And... This is true with observation, and it's true of inference. One thing I've learned from myself studying studying this, and studying so many other things, and this is this is what really makes something a theory so damn strong, is all of what we've discussed today, all of the isotopes, all of the dating. When you contrast that with, you know, what we've spoken about in other episodes to do with medicine, and when we also contrast it with evolution, and basically any kind of science to be honest with you none of the discoveries that we have none of the facts violate some of the theories that we have now that really does show how strong a certain theory is so evolution by natural selection works in coherence with everything discussed today everything Mm -hmm. discussed during medicine it works with biology with just, just just about everything it's ridiculous how many sciences could overturn it but they don't they completely support it it goes back to what you were saying thomas where you said it comes a point where it's kind of strange because you have to know this stuff to really comprehend just what someone's saying when they say that it's all wrong and that some biblical account or some religious account is right it it you it it reminds me of a quote from john uh, cleese which said it requires a certain amount of intelligence to know that you're not intelligent (laughs) <laughs> and without that people speak with conviction well i have to point out too that there are convergent points the convergence points with your data so for example if let's say that you have one piece of data that um a, a creationist says the earth is six thousand years old and then you measure and you realize that well there's a tree that's nine thousand years old Yes. Well, that one piece of data destroys that assumption so then they might say well you know it could be around ten thousand years maybe mm-hmm. Okay, well, now they're they're changing their hypothesis, their perfect book, mm-hmm. in order to try to fit the data. Yeah. Well, why don't they do that, too, when all of a sudden you say, oh, well, but we have networks of trees that are older than that, that are tens of thousands of years old. Yeah. We have ice cores that are, go back 1.5 million years. We have, you know, um, even civilizations here on Earth that are older than that. We have cave paintings that are tens of thousands of years old. We have, you know, ancient tools and artifacts and stuff that are older than that. We have, mm. you know so many different pieces of of data that we can show them that show that the earth is older and every single one of those works perfectly well in term you know with with all of the other scientific data that we've gathered yeah it works perfectly well with an old earth it works perfectly well and so we we take all of this evidence of you know the the rate of mutation and the rate of evolution by natural selection and um all of these different types of dating methods it doesn't matter if you use potassium argon or if you use carbon dating or if you use any other dating method like every single one of these if you measure something that is within the range that it's it's a that it uh um can measure at so obviously past a certain point you said um carbon 14 dating can't go past 50 or 60 thousand years because eventually you you don't have enough of the the isotope left to to measure it yeah but if you measure something that's say twenty thousand years old well, no matter what you measure it with, you're going to get the same results. You know, you're going to get the same um, result from from every different measuring system that you have. Um, whether you have, um, it doesn't matter how you measure stuff. All of the science, all of the data, all of the evidence points to this same conclusion. Yeah. And then scientists try to figure out within a realm of a margin of error, like you know what we where. Yeah, we're we're taking the data and we're trying to get a more and more and more and more accurate um, position on this. But we know that this is the range, and the range of possibilities gets smaller and smaller and smaller the, the closer we hone in on the answer. Whereas not one single piece of evidence in all of this supports the creationist position. And so 
are we going to say that everything that we've gathered, everything that we've learned scientifically, that we just mm-hmm. throw it all out yeah. because we want to hold to this original presupposition? Or are we going to say that, you know, well, we may not know completely 100% accurately to the year, but we know within a range of about 100 million years or so, so the answer. Yeah, there's a point I want to put on that as well, and that is um, a lot of people speak and think that we choose our beliefs. It's like, well, you choose this or you choose that. I know that I don't function that way, and I strongly suspect that others don't either, again, because I have evidence for it. You don't get to choose your beliefs. And when you are exposed to this kind of evidence, and when you really do understand it, it is a wrecking ball. You can't, some people can somehow have cognitive dissonance to the extent where they can entertain both. But a lot of people, people that are really interested in truth, most people interested in truth, they can't do it. And so it's not a matter of choose. It's a matter of you don't get a choice. You you have your own opinion. I respect your opinion, but you, you're not entitled to your own facts. The facts are here for everyone to observe. Uh, just I just wanted to say with what you were saying about science adapting, you know, we find, we have a tree. that uh, We date a tree. It puts the earth to 10,000 years old. Science has changed its mind. Um, uh, in this case, Christianity didn't. Then you push it back further. You go, well, here we go. We found 80,000 year old um, uh, colonial colony tree. Well, science changes its mind. It puts it back. And you get that on and on and on. So new carbon dating put it back 60,000 years and it went further and further and further. This is not necessarily the chronological order, but it serves the point I'm trying to make. A lot of people like to say science changes its mind. It might change its mind again. And I've had this conversation with people recently and it's it just shows scientific illiteracy. That mm-hmm. science, this is a strength. And it's they don't just change their mind. Oh, we no longer think that's true. We no longer think the universe is 13.8 billion years or whatever it is. It will be something's come in that is works with all of the evidence and it's a stronger theory. And now we've moved our post to that. And I thought, it can would... you imagine if a court case worked like that? <laughs> if, if someone <laughs> said, like, oh, yeah, you know, I think I saw him at the scene of the crime. And yeah. so, you know, you're like, oh, yeah, we think, you know, he's a suspect. Oh, but then we found DNA evidence and fingerprints and all this stuff, and it's actually this guy. Oh, well, but look, science changed its mind. It's not really reliable. (laughs) It's like, no, that's not how it works. It's like we get better data, and we refine our position based off of the better data. That's a fantastic way of putting it. Yeah, that's fantastic. I just wanted to add on to that as well, um, a quote from Tim Minchin, which is, Mm -hmm. science adjusts its views based on what's observed. Faith is the denial of observation so that belief Mm -hmm. can be preserved. Just yeah. gets it in a nutshell, really. Yeah, it does. Exactly. There's um, there's something that Ken Ham wrote in one of his like ridiculous books where he talks about like who would you rather trust, um, you know, a book written by God who was there who like never changes his mind, or scientists who are constantly like I, I think he worded it like constantly changing the goalposts or constantly like changing the outcome or whatever. And I'm like, well, I'd rather believe in something or someone who will happily admit when they're wrong yeah. it's, it's also a yeah completely you know agree I mean? and it's also that start as a special pleading case it starts with mm. the premise it's trying to prove it starts yeah. with do you want to believe a god that exists that witnessed it mm-hmm. it's like well you've already yeah. started from what you're trying to prove this is ridiculous yeah well and here's yeah. here's the thing if if i had evidence for god i'd change my position in a heartbeat oh same, really oh, same. yeah absolutely yeah and, absolutely mm-hmm. and i everything that i know about the universe i'm like I don't think that, you know, some type of deistic God that that could have set it all in motion, whether it's a God that evolved and that is some type of super powerful alien or something, or whether it's, I, I don't know, like, it's not completely outside the realm of possibilities to me. I don't see any evidence for it. And without evidence, I'm not going to put that forward as the most likely mm-hmm. proposition because I see a lot of evidence that this came about naturally mm. and that it can come about naturally and that it probably did come about naturally. Yeah. Now, I'm open to the position of it, but I think the the notion of, you know, something as simple and obviously man-made like the Bible or the Quran mm-hmm. or the Book of Mormon is so laughably insane because we yeah. know that that humans try to rationalize and try to figure out how, you know, by just saying, oh, well, we don't know, therefore it's this or therefore it's that. And we're always trying to just throw out these ideas of without evidence – I had some yeah. revelation. We know that the human mind plays tricks on us. We know mm-hmm. that we hallucinate. We know that we see things that aren't there. And so if if the wiring is on our brain to have all of these weird 
experiences naturally and we can replicate those experiences in the lab and still have people thinking that they had a supernatural mm -hmm. experience when it's just chemicals and we have all this evidence that that's not the case then for someone to put forth this proposition that you know all of this happened 6000 years ago with you in mind and you're so special it's just extremely mm -hmm. narcissistic and extremely yeah. narrow minded it's it's doesn't really except all of the other evidence that we have about how the world works. Yeah. One of the big um, sort of comments I was got on YouTube uh, when I say things like, oh, well, you know, if I got proof of God, of course, I believe there was one if I saw proof. They always say like, but are you, are you willing to look for that truth? Are you willing to um, like look for that evidence inside of you? Are you willing to put the work in to experience that evidence? And I'm like, well, n no, because like, I'm not going to waste my time on something that where I don't think there's going to be an outcome. Like, I wouldn't suddenly pack up my life and go live in the woods to go in search of Bigfoot. You know, because yeah. there's, there's no proof that he's there. There's no proof that I'm going to find Bigfoot. Yeah. I don't have any reason to believe that Bigfoot exists, so I'm you... not going to waste my time searching for him. It's the same yeah. with God. If I can't get any solid evidence, or even... <sighs> if there's no reason to believe I'll find solid evidence within me... I'm not going to waste my time looking for it and, you know, having faith that he's going to be there, if that makes sense. Well, and that's also, that's not how science works. It's, science it's doesn't say, like, we, we believe that there's a boogeyman, therefore we're going to go and try to find all the little evidence points that confirm mm. our pre-existing yep. bias. Yeah. It's like, no, we look at how the universe works, we study and observe how the universe works, and then based off of the, the, the data that we gather, we try to, um, you know, infer... Uh, how everything works based off of the the evidence. It's not, exactly. you know, this is how we think it works, and now we're going to try to find things that confirm it. Yeah, and cherry pick the data. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Nice. Also, my 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 favorite creationist argument. I think we we just refuted in this episode, and that's where it's it's kind of a an argument from design where they'll you know or fine tuning where mm -hmm. they'll say. You know, well, how do you know that God exists? And they'll say, look to the trees, just look at the trees. Yeah. Look at you know, it's just it's so finely done. But it's the the best answer to that would be which one the the trees that are older than your Bible. Uh, I've got an even better answer, um, although it's not quite as poetic, and that is from David Attenborough. It's also been mentioned by Stephen Fry, but the, the date the date I can get it from is the longest date I can get it from is from Attenborough. He's asked all the time because he deals with nature. How can you not believe in God when you're seeing these wonderful creations? Uh, creation meaning that you're basically special, pleading at that point. And he says, yeah, look, you, you see the wonderful, you know, duck going through the water so elegantly. But I also see there's species that its sole purpose, its only way of living is by burrowing into the eyes of little children in Africa. Now, I can't see that and say that there is a product of a god that loves humankind or that isn't, is, he, is indeed loving at all. And he combined that with a couple of other things. So he says, when someone says, look at the trees, he goes, yeah, look, look at ascoriasis. Look, at, look at the guinea worm. Like the, bone cancer in children. Bone What's can that about? Yeah. 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 Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> He's right to get angry with that. Yeah. But, um, but Steve, it's just because of sin. It's because you're mm -hmm. a filthy, worthless creature and you were born filthy and worthless. And yeah. that's why, you know, you have to be saved. Yeah. If, if being filthy and dirty is wanting to know the truth and not just accepting, um, divine authority, then man, I am a filthy whore. <laughs> Remember original sin was daring to ask questions and want to know, wanting to have knowledge. Exactly. exactly. Knowledge of good and evil. Yeah, when, and it's yeah, like, when, no, knowledge is a good thing. Yeah, Doubt yeah. away. Yeah. That's actually a really good point. It's like, is there a conflict between science and uh, religion? One way you could put it is that the enemy is knowledge according to religion. It's it's the fruit of knowledge. Um but yeah. Doubting Thomas is the villain. Exact exactly. It's like, no, he's using the scientific method. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're a bad He's man. Saying, I want to observe. I want to touch. <laughs> yeah. So I shall wrap up and leave our audience to their lovely evening, day, whatever it might be. There's going to be some person that's listening to this at 4 a.m. while driving. I reckon that's that's my prediction. Let's go back to Clev Wins. Don't crash. Yeah, don't crash, please. Um, and if... Look out in front of you. There's a semi. <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't help myself. It's beautiful. Do, uh, so I was going to say, what topic are you bringing to us next week, Thomas? Do you know at all, or are we going to wait with bated breath? That's tough. Mm. Part of me wants to do the age of the universe. Yeah, 
But there's there's so much overlap with this one. I might I, I think I'll spread that one out a little bit. Do it. All right. Well, what two. we do is we say you've got dibs on it, and you can have it in a month or two. <laughs> <laughs> or, or or better yet, the creation of the universe, like how how it all came from. But there's yeah. so much complex physics involved in that that I would have to do way more research than a week will allow. Yeah. No, a, no, it was it really simple. That there, there was this god, and he just said. <laughs> I think there should be something here, and then it just popped into existence. So like, uh, that doesn't need research. <laughs> Done. <laughs> yeah. See, we covered it. Done. Exactly. <laughs> so, so next week's mm. topic will be an amazing mystery. I mean, an amazing mm. mystery. It sounds very good. I'm I'm mm. tuned in. I'm ready for it. So hopefully mm. our audiences as well. Can we um, actually do the science behind some big mystery? The science behind Ooh. a big mystery. Hang on. What? Yeah. Like like you said, next week's topic will be some big mystery. Can we take like some big sort of mystery that the whole world believes in and that they're like, ooh, it's unexplained and explain it? Ooh, ooh, I could do the Bermuda Triangle. Ooh, yeah, something like that. I ain't got mis- mysteries explained by science. I could mm-hmm. have a couple because I could, yeah. could break apart B- Bermuda Triangle pretty quickly, but there's like several others. Yeah. <laughs> the <Yeah>. pyramids. <laughs> mm. I, I think it would be really cool. Or- I'll finally mm. show you, Steve, how the pyramids are not a complex structure. <laughs> yeah, let, let, let's have that. I'll show you exactly how they're made. <laughs> I'm I'm looking forward to it. And the best thing is, if you show it to me and you've got good evidence, you'll change my mind. And that's the beauty okay. of it. Um, Wonderful. And just to the audience as well, if if you have ideas or topics you'd like us to take on, send it our way. We're, we're more than open. Yeah. And on that note, we're bid you farewell thank you for the view this has been an absolute blast and now we want you to join in the conversation over on the here and now facebook and twitter pages or follow us on pinterest and instagram if you just want some of the dankest of sciencey memes if you like one of our particular styles check out each of our youtube channels rachel oates rationality rules by stephen woodford and holy kool-aid by me thomas westbrook to find all of our episodes, show notes, contact information, and more, warp on over to our home base, theherenow.com. If you enjoyed this episode and want us to succeed in spreading the love of science, you can help us out by giving us a five-star review on iTunes or Stitcher. And to all our friends and family listening, thank you for spending this episode with us. We'll be back to explore another exciting big idea next week. Now go create something magnificent. <laughs>